because you're jumping back into the gut. Oh, let's hey, go. Coach. Welcome to the Basketball Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Oliver. I appreciate you joining us for this week's podcast. Be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to the show and visit basketballimmersion.com for more coaching resources and access to all the basketball podcasts. I hope you will give us a shout out on social media, on Twitter at Bball Immersion, or on Instagram at Basketball Immersion to help me continue to share the game. Enjoy the episode. Coach's real treat today, John Becker is with us. And uh, Coach Becker is now going to go into his 10th season at the University of Vermont and has had the Catamounts to nine 21 seasons, eight straight postseason bursts, won four American East tournament titles, five American East regular season crowns and then state tournament win. And coach, wow. Like, uh, you know, you mentioned off air just briefly, you can't believe how many years it's been, but the success has been incredible. Yeah, it's been a great run so far. And I was fortunate to take a program that was pretty healthy and in a good spot coming off Tom Brennan and, and Mike Lonergan. And, you know, and we've been able with great continuity on my staff, which is a big deal. And with a uh, great administration, been able to continue to push this thing forward. And, and we're really excited and proud with uh, where our program is. Well, and as you should be, and just so many places we can go with that success and everything else. And we wanted to focus on one area, which is the defensive side, because I think you've done some things that, you know, I think most coaches have either gone through this process or starting to go through this process. And that's modernizing your defense for the way the game's played. Can you talk to that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a great observation. And, you know, we have a very structured, disciplined, defensive philosophy, but we've had to evolve as the game has changed. And especially with, um, you know, the, the three-point shot, you know, and, and one area where we've made some changes is, is off the ball. We bring help from what we call the hole, which is, um, you know, the, the guy two passes away, essentially. And that hole has kind of gotten stretched from the, the restricted arc, kind of dead underneath the rim, out, you know, straddling the lane line, essentially, and, you know, to kind of prevent teams kind of what teams I felt were doing was from the wing, just driving the ball towards the baseline and trying to engage your help and then skipping it to the corner and then getting you in scramble and trying to keep the ball ahead of your defense. And, and you know, we were giving up some uh, threes and we had a couple of years where our three point percentage defense wasn't wasn't good enough and and so that's one area that I've noticed a change transition defense is another area you know I think with the way that everyone plays offense including us now mostly five out offense you know we basically have sacrificed offensive rebounding or decided to sacrifice offensive rebounding for improved transition defense and I think last year we might have been one of the top 10 transition defensive teams in the country. And it, we send our four and fives can go to the glass, but one through three is getting back. And in most cases, you know, most all five guys are, are getting back because they're outside the three point line. And so those are a few, few of the areas that we change. The other thing that we changed, we used to be a four sideline baseline team and we've kind of changed our terminology um, and really just try to keep the ball out of the paint now. So even if guys are potentially driving middle, uh, we want to try to level them off and, and, and keep them out of the paint. So it's more of keeping the ball out of the paint as opposed to really getting in a defensive position on the ball where you're maybe too wide open in an effort to take away middle and force sideline baseline. And again, it's just another way that the hole can get engaged unnecessarily and, and get you in scramble, which, um, you know, that's the key, trying to stay out of scramble. And we're going to talk about a bunch of these things and dive a little bit deeper with them because, again, a lot of great insights already there. Let's maybe start with transition defense and maybe talk a little bit. You know, we're playing against all these spread offenses now. And traditionally in transition defense, one of the first things you cover is the basket. Has that changed a little bit in our mentality in terms of not covering the basket and getting out a little bit wider on the weak side in recovery? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a challenge. I mean, defensively, whether we're in transition or we're in the half court, one of our tenants is, you know, you got to have the ball and the hole covered. And then we kind of build our defense around that in, until we can get, you know, set, so to speak. And so we still are telling our guys, first guy back is sprinting to the hole and calling the hole. Second guy back is getting the ball. But what's really challenging and what we're trying to do is get the guy to the hole and then have him evaluate the situation because now most teams are running to the three-point line so it's this getting to the hole and fanning out to shooters or finding shooters if, if there's no big that's rim running or 
there's no threat at the rim or, or you know with a cutter or with a guy there so it's kind of sprinting getting to the hole evaluating and then fanning to shooters and you know that's something that is a challenge and and something we work on every day and it takes a while to kind of to get that because the guy gets to the hole a lot of times he thinks all right I'm at the hole this is my job I'm staying here and, and doesn't really flow and so uh, out to shooters and, and it costs us we lost the same Bonaventure a few years ago at their place on a last second three where we um, were in transition and we didn't fan out to a three-point shooter that, uh, that ultimately made a shot and so we've uh, that's something that we continue like you said evolve as a defense and, and really you know try to get out there and, and uh, try to do both you know if we can. Well, and you already alluded to the challenge of doing both. So, yeah, it's fascinating stuff. And, uh, you know, it's it, and again, you're countering not just traditional coaching, but you're countering what players have been taught probably progressively getting to you as well, which is another part of that process that, you know, a lot of and, and rightly so at high school, we haven't na- needed to make as many of these changes as you would at the collegiate level and beyond. You know, one thing, yeah, that's why it takes a little while. Freshmen usually don't come into our program. And we've been fortunate that we've been able, you know, to have talented players and, and, and be in a good place as a program where we haven't been forced to play younger guys. And I think these are some of the nuances that take a little while to, to understand and, and gain the, the trust of the coaching staff in order to play as a young player. So that's kind of, you know, an advanced concept that, um, yeah, a lot of guys may not have uh, – covered in high school or have been challenged with. But, you know, I, I really, as a, as a teacher, you know, I really believe, you know, we, we take a lot of, you know, probably 70% of our practice is, is spent on defense, um, at least for the first couple months of the year. And I'm really into um, teaching guys every situation that I can, can think of and really drill the main ones and, you know, get them to a point where these things are hopefully second nature and, and it varies from guy to guy, but um, those that can pick, pick up the defensive concepts at a young age. And if they're good enough, they play, but if not, we stay patient. And, but uh, we have high expectations on both sides of the ball, but especially defensive side of the ball. Yeah. And uh, we're going to get into the teaching process because again, I've heard so many mention, so many people mention obviously the quality of your teaching and everything that goes into it. So before we get there, let's go back to some of these modernized things. So this help at the rim and helping at the rim from, you know, the, the two side type of concept, is that influence everything that you do within your game planning, say defensive, obviously on the ball coverage, but also ball screen coverage. Are you focused on bringing help from a two side as much as possible? So the way that I like to, to set up before, you know, if, if you're going to talk about ball, let's talk about ball screen coverages, which, you know, everyone has a couple, including us. And, and what is there, six or, you know, seven ways maybe you can do it. We try to focus on probably three, maybe four in a year. But, but what I do is uh, start the year and we, we're, we hard hedge to start the year. And I think that's the hardest coverage to do. And so, you know, can, can you talk, talk about, about maybe why you, you why do you start with the hard hedge then? Yeah, yeah. So, so we so hard hedging. So we had the 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 two guys involved with the ball screen action, and when we you know are first practicing, we go over every ball screen just because again going over and hard hedging you know on the ball going over the screen and hard hedging I think is the the hardest way to do it. So on the ball everybody goes over a screen. So we really work on you know, on the ball, listening for the big, why it's really important for the the, the big, assuming the big is, is setting the screen. We'll just assume that, although I know inverted ball screens are now become in vogue a little bit. We do it quite a bit, but but let's say the big, you know, the big's got to call out the screen that's coming. And at that point, the guy in the ball is changing his angle to force the, force the ball over the screen, into the screen where his help is. And we don't want to get rejected in those ball screens. So we really work on that. The big, you know, really coming out and getting his chest to the sideline. And really his job is to get the ball retreating. So the the guy on the ball is getting over the screen and under the hedge, uh, his own man, getting through to the other side, releasing the big. And so that, it, you know, very quickly is, is the on-ball action. Now off the ball, we then break it up into – Two man sides and three man sides. So on a three man side, where on the where the ball screen's getting set, there's a guy in the corner, 
we cover the role, assuming the, the big roles, we cover that role with the guy in the corner. He comes off his man in the corner, gets on top of the role, and we don't bring, we don't cover that role with the weak side guy, um, like a lot of NBA teams might do. Right. Um, we cover it uh, with the same side guy in the corner on a three man side. Once the big sprints back, the big hedges is released by the guard. Once he says he's through, sprints back to the rim and releases the guy in the corner. So the shot that technically maybe we give up is that replacing wing or guard coming out of the corner. But again, we teach this technique of getting on top of the role, not getting underneath the role where you basically are getting, you know, if they throw back to the replacement, you end up getting screened out. So if you're on top of it, you're letting the role man kind of go by you and you're covering it from the top side, usually with your length. And then it gives you, if they throw back to your man who's replacing out of the corner, it gives you a free run to kind of close out and contest to that guy replacing out of the corner. On a two-man side, we X out. So we bring the guy two passes away on the weak, you know, which would be the weak side block. As the ball screen's happening, as the big is calling out the ball screen, whoever is guarding the guy in the corner or in the short corner on the opposite side slides over to the strong side block, and we set up a triangle off the ball. We kind of zone up on the backside on the two-man side. We have the nail covered and both blocks covered. So, if, And we only, the guy in the X out position only releases to the popping. Usually you pop on a two-man side. On the popping big, you are only going to cover him or truly Xing out if the ball is thrown to that man. So we work a lot on not kind of sprinting out to the popping big if the ball isn't thrown to him, if it's thrown, you know, if it's thrown ahead or whatever it may be. We want you to load. We're loading to the X out spot by getting to the ball side block. Um, and you're only closing out, Xing out if the ball is thrown to that popping big. So that's kind of, and then quickly, the, the kind of the ball screen coverage is two man side, three man side. Then there's always the middle of the court ball screens. And in those situations, we like to weak those screens and you know that's pretty pretty common and typical i think that the challenging screens now you know these good offensive minds you know and at the nba level that filter down to the college level it's kind of those horn screens that may not be true horns where there's not two guys up there well those screen you know those those horns type screens where you're screening to the sideline i think those are a little bit more challenging uh to cover and, and a little bit more advanced but but that's the ball screen action. But to get back to your, maybe your original question was this whole concept of whole help. Yeah, basically we don't strong side help. So anything from the slot or the wing that is driven towards the baseline and sideline, you know, if, if a guy's on the wing or in the slot and it's driven and, and there's a guy in the corner, we really load to help early. So we call it being in our 50s. Uh, so you're halfway, if you're off the ball, one pass away, you're halfway between your man and the ball early and really creating kind of a wall. And so if a guy is in the slot, you know, wing area, he should see a guy at the nail um, and a guy up in the wing spot if his man is in the corner. And then the hole help two passes away. If the ball's above the free throw line, He's going to be at the the whole help will be straddling the opposite lane line. If the ball's below the free throw line, uh, the hole will be dead underneath the rim. So there's kind of two positionings based on where the ball is on the wing or uh, or in the corner. But anyway, if the ball is driven sideline baseline, we're gonna we're in our fifties out of the corner. We're bluffing early to kind of try to uh, disrupt timing and recovering to the corner and to our man. And if help is needed, it's brought from that whole guy who, you know, as that ball is dribbled, dribbled from above the free throw line, below the free throw line, he's now moving with it towards the rim and hopefully can get outside the restricted arc and take a charge. We don't, we, we don't encourage or teach trying to block shots out of the hole. It's all uh, position based where you're trying to step up, take a charge, or wall up. And obviously, and not obviously, but but I guess the concept, again, you know, once that hole is engaged, 
we now are in scramble, we call it. So they're cover down, coming on the weak side, and then guys are ready to scramble. Um, and we work on scrambling every day. And, you know, those concepts are basically, once we're the holes engaged, we're in scramble, we got to get that cover down. And then, you know, if it's skipped to the corner or anywhere else, we're all as a team turning and sprinting towards the ball, communicating. And um, we don't, you know, we got to get the ball covered, obviously, first. And then we can fill in one pass away and, you know, we'll be cross matched and all that kind of stuff. But um, the goal is not to get, to get in scramble as least possible, you know, as, as few as time as possible uh, throughout a game is, is ideal for us. So take a brief moment to interrupt this podcast to share some information from one of our show supporters. As sports keep coming back, so does your chance to bet on them with our exclusive wagering partner, betonline.ag. Major League Baseball will soon be in full swing, and there are no shortage of ways to get in on the action. BetOnline has all the odds, futures, and props for you to be on. Also tune in as Floyd Money Mayweather Weather joins BetOnline team in a new segment called The Ice is Right, where he talks about his expansive jewelry collection. He'll give you the chance to win some great prizes and bet on the cost of his bling. Visit betonline.ag today to check out all the odds and up-to-date sports news. Don't forget to sign up and take advantage of all the Welcome Back to Sports bonuses. BetOnline, your online wagering experts. Now back to the podcast. So saying that, Coach, though, I imagine you guys practice scramble situations. Right. Oh, because, yeah. because you know how dangerous they are. You probably spend a lot of time working on scramble situations, even though you don't want them to happen. Absolutely. And, and that's we work on that every day. And um, like I said, a majority of our practice is defense. We build up every day kind of systematically uh, from, you know, closeout techniques uh, to sliding to, um, you know, a rebounding drill uh, to a scramble drill to a transition defense drill, to shell drill. And within shell drill, uh, we'll have four or five different segments a day covering different uh, actions. You know, we'll always start with positional, we call it, which is just four guys kind of moving uh, as the ball's moving, you know, and, and working on on-ball positioning, one pass away positioning, two pass away positioning. And and then we um, do exchanges where guys are exchanging on the weak side and working through uh, how that looks, um, working on, you know, how we handle, you know, scramble situation, driving the ball, uh, engaging the hole, scrambling, so forth and so on. So, yeah. And I think one of the most important things for a great defense is your ability to scramble. And the key to scrambling to me is getting the ball stopped. And, you know, what you, what you see a lot is when teams get in scramble, they may make the effort, you know, to, to, to hustle, to, to get to the ball. Uh, but then they really, um, a lot of, you know, you, you see a lot in my mind, just teams, or, you know, where they just break, you know, they scramble and they think they made the effort, uh, but then they don't finish it off with a great closeout. They either fly by, they leave their feet, um, but really, I think the key is to close out short when you're in scramble sprint, close out short, hopefully get the, the ball stopped, you know, where the guy's not sure or just holds the ball, um, doesn't shoot, doesn't pass. You're closed out short. And then once he, you get it stopped, then you can advance and then we can get our defense reset. Um, so really getting that ball stopped in scramble situations is really hard to do. But that's, you know, when you can see, when you can see teams do defensively, when you can see teams do that, that's usually a sign of a really good defense. Well, tremendous. All, all this is tremendous depth and insight. So thank you for sharing this. And like, you're talking about the completion of a scramble. So the, the, like a positive completion of a scramble. And I'm glad you separated those two things because I think that's tremendous too. But is that something you chart? Is that something you come back to on film and evaluate? Because clearly that's something that's important in your defense. Yeah. You know what? I'm not a big charting guy. You know, we don't chart a lot of stuff in practice. I do have a coach go, you know, we do keep some shooting charts, um, you know, percentage guys shoot and stuff like that. But defensively, I don't chart anything, to be honest with you. It's just my, you know, um, I, you know, I just stop it when I see it, you know, and, and, uh, um, you know, and guys, yeah, they understand, 
um, how important that is and when they do it and when they don't do it. And, um, you know, we'll just keep repping it until we can get it right. Or, um, but, you know, we, we do do a lot of film work. So every practice is filmed and, um, you know, I'll go through the defensive stuff and we'll break it down. And if I, uh, if it's an individual, um, having a problem with something, you know, in this case, closeouts, then usually I'll bring them up and we'll go through that. If it's a bunch of guys doing that, then as a team, we'll watch it and continue to emphasize it. Um, but, um, I'm not a big chart guy. We don't really chart very much. Um, um, but we do a lot of, uh, film work. It's not cool to say that anymore, coach. Yeah, I know. <laughs> you know, I, know. I, I wasn't know. a big chart guy either. And a lot of that had to do, which I, I believe is probably the case for a lot of coaches, you know, at some of the, you know, less resource schools is you just don't have the resources to do all the things that you would want to do anyways. Yeah. So you pick your battles, so to speak. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just not, yeah, I, um, we've, we've gotten, you know, there's a lot more people now involved in my, in my program. I got a lot of people around. I could, we could be doing that at this point, but, um, it's just not something I, um, yeah, I, I guess, yeah, you got to pick your battles. You got to prioritize. You got to know how you work and how you process information and what you need. And, um, as of now, that's just not something that, um, I felt like, uh, that, that we need right now. And, and, um, um, but you know, we'll see. We'll see. Well, I know as a listener to the podcast, you can appreciate this. Again, it just puts out there's just different ways to do this. Cause look at your incredible success and nobody could ever say you're wrong. And obviously nobody could say someone else is wrong to a certain extent either. It's what your preferences are. Exactly right. So t- what, where, where does being in your fifties come from? Where does that terminology come from? That's really, you cool know, actually, me. um, I got that, uh, from coach Donlin, who is, who's now at UMKC, who is at, who is the defensive coordinator, who's been a friend of mine for a long time and was at North uh, Michigan and then Northwestern as kind of the defensive coordinator. Um, and we've become, you know, we're both big defensive guys and we met a couple of years ago at the final four and um, we're just, you know, throwing around some, some stuff. And, and that, that was a language that he was using that I thought was really, you know, defensively, we did, did a lot of the same stuff. Um, but I really like that terminology and we've really started to use it. I think last year might've been the first year we used it. So it really, um, um, you know, it, it really clarifies things, um, because we were using, you know, um, you know, using more vague terminology or, you know, um, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, I felt guys would, you know, like, you know, if, if you were too, if you were too close to your man and not close enough to the ball, you were getting too huggy. And, um, you know, we use terminology like that. Now 50 is halfway between the ball and your man. Um, you know, you can, you can be, and then, and, and then scouting report wise, if, you know, you're guarding a good shooter, maybe you only want to be in your 30 or only 30% away from your man. Um, so you're a little bit closer to your man because he's a shooter. Uh, you may be 70, uh, which means you're 70% away from your man. He's a non-shooter. He can really help more to the ball. Um, and so that's something that just um, really tends to me. And, and it's been really helpful. It makes it really clear for our guys. And it's been able to translate not only into teaching, but into scouting reports. Um you know, it's, it's, uh, it's been really helpful, but, uh, but Billy Donovan, I, I kind of stole that from. Yeah, that's very cool. It's very cool to hear that. And another ter- term that I've heard you use is this loop technique to your closeouts. Can you talk about that? Yeah. And so, um, when we're closing, uh, so we really don't want the ball to get middle. Um, again, like I said earlier, this used to be, um, you know, we were sideline baseline, no middle, no middle, no middle, you know, it was like, no, no middle. And, and so what I found were guys were really starting to straddle the, on the ball, really get ex- open in an open stance where they were really just walling off the, the, the middle drive, um, which was allowing kind of a straight line drive, sideline, baseline. The good part of that is it was going into the help, which was built in at the, with the whole help and at the rim. And so it wasn't bad but then when the three-point thing uh, you know when everyone went to the three-point line you got everyone could shoot and they really got the court spaced um it was just a situation where it was forcing us um 
into scramble too much. So um, we've really changed that terminology where we're square on the ball. We're just shading the inside shoulder again. So you're, um, you're, you're in a better position to guard the ball and, and not require any help um, while still hopefully influencing uh, the ball to where your help is, which is sideline baseline. And, um, but one thing I found is that if what guys do in these closeout drills or just closing out in general is it's just a dead sprint straight to your man. And when you sprint straight at your man, um, I think you end up closing on the closing out to the low side, um, you know, more often than not. So this looping technique is kind of coming, um, you know, taking like a, um, a not quite a, a semicircle, but kind of coming inside out as you come, as you sprint from your help spot to your man that now has the ball. If you take this looping technique, if the ball is driven middle, you know, as you're, as you're closing out, you're kind of, they're going to, they're going to dribble right into you. Um, it also helps you get um, to that inside shoulder uh, much better, you know? And so this is, is a difficult concept. Um, and, you know, we do this four spot closeout drill every day where we have guys in the, f- the four shell positions, essentially. And, you know, guy starts out under the basket and he's, and he's closing out to all four spots. Um, and uh, so that's really a good place where we can work on all of our closeout technique, but really, really emphasize this, this looping um, technique as you close out. And, um, and then you hope that it can translate to live situations. And, and um, you know, it, it, that, that translation, take, that, that takes a while. And it's usually once they get a year or so in the program that they feel more comfortable with it. But it's really this way to prevent closing out low and um, um, giving up middle drives um, when you're, when you're kind of coming out of your help position. And d- does that, does that vary a little bit by scout or do you keep it pretty consistent no matter whether righties or lefties you're closing out on? Yeah, we don't. Yeah. So we don't, we don't on the sides of the court, we don't really care if they're righty or lefties. We're okay. always going to work some sideline baseline. So there's situations on the side of the court where we may be forcing a guy to strong hand, but no, uh, we don't worry about um, your dominant hand necessarily um, other than in the middle of the court when we weak it. Um, and then, um, you know, as the year goes on and we've really have established um, uh, the, the core structure of our defense and we can, you know, tweak a little bit more, um, maybe in ball screen situations, uh, we may handle a guy differently if, um, you know, if he's super, um, you know, there's guys that really can come off a ball screen going one in their dominant hand or, or, or one hand, um, and, and not on the other side of the court. And so sometimes we may, um, you know, mess with our ball screen coverages, but that we rarely do that. I have to have a pretty experienced team and, um, to kind of pull that stuff off. But, um, you know, uh, I try to keep, you know, I'm really a big, uh, like I said, we will, we'll hard hedge for the first month of this, you know, for the, for the first month of practice and into the first couple games, even though hard hedging is, kind of a thing of the past. I know some really good teams still do it. Uh, Michigan State, some teams still do it, but it really exposes you um, if the guard's good enough to kind of get, you know, you're putting two on the ball, and if the guard can get that ball out of there cleanly, you know, in today's game, you're really, you're in scramble and you're really opening yourself up. So, um, but I do think it's the hardest way to guard. So, it and it really tests, it really tests all of, all of the facets of your defense on and off the ball. And so I really believe in doing that. So we really don't work on many other ball screen coverages um, for the first month of the year. And, you know, we'll get killed uh, in practice. Uh, but I think it, it touches on everything um, and the hardest stuff. So when you get into switching, it becomes much easier. If you, if you flat hedge, which we do quite a bit, or level coverage, we call it flat hedge. Um, you know, um, it, it, 
all the, you know, you don't really have to account for the role, man, as much as you do in it with a hard hedge. So, um, but, but just like strong hand, we, I, I really try to um, play it if we can as much one way for as long as we can um, so that the, 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 the techniques and the fundamentals are really drilled into the guys and we're doing the hardest thing first. Um, and then we can, as the year goes on and, you know, through the non-conference and then certainly when we get into conference play, we have a really good foundation uh, for our defense and really have um, done it the hardest way. And then, then we can really start to add on, you know, uh, scouting report, game to game tweaks and really uh, attack it that way. And, and, um, but, you know, I, I just think if you try to do too much too early and you're introducing all these different ball screen coverages and, you know, depending on the ball screen coverages, there's going to be different stuff you have to do off the ball. And I just think if, you know, if every game you're changing everything you do defensively, it's hard to be good at anything. And there's really not a, the foundation just doesn't settle long enough for me. Um, and so um, usually by uh, December, um, you know, you know, practice are starting to get mundane. Mistakes are really limited and guys are really understanding and, and executing. Um, then we can move on and start to really get into uh, the adjustments and some of the different stuff that, different stuff that um, you know, we can get into. Take a brief moment to interrupt this podcast to share some information from one of our show supporters. As sports keep coming back, so does your chance to bet on them with our exclusive wagering partner, betonline.ag. Major League Baseball will soon be in full swing, and there are no shortage of ways to get in on the action. BetOnline has all the odds, futures, and props for you to be on. Also tune in as Floyd Money Mayweather Weather joins BetOnline team in a new segment called The Ice is Right, where he talks about his expansive jewelry collection. He'll give you the chance to win some great prizes and bet on the cost of his bling. Visit betonline.ag today to check out all the odds and up-to-date sports news. Don't forget to sign up and take advantage of all the Welcome Back to Sports bonuses. BetOnline, your online wagering experts. Hey coaches, brief interruption from our podcast to hear from Manscaped.com. 2020 has been the year of things happening that are completely out of your control. But there is one thing that you can control, and that's shaving your bush. You may be surprised how many coaches have already DM'd me about this special offer. I wasn't, because I'm a user and Manscaped.com is definitely worth it. Our sponsors at Manscaped are here to remind you to do so. The Manscaped Lawnmower 3.0 is a premium electric trimmer that's designed to give you a confidence boost through body image. Their ceramic blade and skin safe technology are designed to reduce nicks and tugs on your fellows down low. The Lawnmower 3.0 is also waterproof and comes with an LED light so you can manscape in the shower, in the dark, or in a dark shower, whatever floats your boat. Go to manscaped.com and check out some of these life-changing products. In fact, listeners of this show will get 20% off plus free shipping with the code armchair at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com and use code armchair. It's time to grab 2020 by the horns by shaving that front trunk. Now back to the podcast. So I guess for, for people that are still kind of, I guess, learning about this loop technique or have heard it for the first time, or maybe have, have used it a little bit, what are, what are some of the challenges for players in terms of maybe the most common things you have to correct? And then maybe the second part is, what are we talking about in terms of actual arrival, uh, you know, after the closeout? So if you completed the closeout, what's the goal then? You've talked about not letting it go middle. Um, if you contain it, are we talking arm length? Are we talking scout specific? What are some of the things we're doing there? Yeah, so we're really, uh, um, like you said, if we, if we get to the closeout, if we can, um, you know, Big picture philosoph, we want to live with contested jump shots um, it, it is, is really what, so we're going to close out, you know, some of the things is guys closing out too tight to the ball is a very common thing. You know, we want to close, you know, so we really got to fight that. And, you know, if anything, close out a little bit short, advance to the ball, an arm and a half length away, use your length um, and, 
pressure the ball, um, you know, with your feet and with your hands, um, but not, um, you know, one thing I, I, I don't emphasize going for steals. I don't, we don't track deflections. Uh, we don't, the one pass away, we aren't trying to get in passing lanes and steal the ball. At the rim, we're not trying to block shots. Um, I really believe in making a team score over you, um, you know, um, and, and, and I guess on the ball, um, the last, you know, we always want to have high hands, right? So when we do close out drills, we close out with two high hands um, because I really think it helps with your positioning, understanding your positioning. Um, but ultimately we want to have at least one high hand, um, because, you know, to be able to move laterally, I think having two high hands is it, it, you know, you have to be a special athlete to have, to, to be able to then to win that first step battle, to be able to slide laterally. So one high hand, and we always want, um, our inside hand to be high. So I know, you know, our players sometimes are like, well, you know, if I'm on a certain side of the court and the guy's a right-handed shooter and I have my, um, you know, my right, you know, I'm not necessarily contesting uh, on the ball, so to speak. Um, or if the guy's a lefty, you know, that, that can, you know, depending on what side of the court you're on. So, um, so we really want to have a high hand. And one thing I really emphasize to our guys, and this is a common thing, when you're guarding the ball, you, you close out with high hands, the guy holds the ball. Now you drop your hands and that you have them on your side. Um, you know, at the college level, um, you, you have to keep a high hand, even when you're, when, when the guy is, is, is holding the ball, because you put your hands down, the guy gets into a shooting motion. He's, you know, you know, guys are getting good where they have quicker releases and, and getting it to a high position pretty quickly. Um, to come from your hands to your side to get them up to contest, it's that's an easy shot. Closing out inside hand high at least, you know, two hands is great, but not required. Uh, inside hand high, um, active, um, and then when the guy gets into a shot, we're you know we're we're the second jumper, six inches in front of the ball, getting a contest, and so. If we can get teams to take contested jump shots uh, over our defense, um, that's exactly um, what we want. And, you know, we've lost six conference games in the last four years um, total. Um, and those games, teams have shot the three really well and made a lot of uh, tough contested threes. And, and in, those case, you know, in those cases, we'll, we'll uh, tip our hat to the other team. But, but I just think... Um, I'm just not into gambling defenses um, because I think you're just, there's too many times you're going to let a team score without having to earn it. Um, and uh, I just, um, uh, I, you know, we, we really want to be disciplined. We want to be physical on the, on the drive on and any ball that's being dribbled. Um, we want to be organized and, and, and really defensively uh, building up this trust um, and five, you know, we talk about five guys on a string, um, but really building up this trust that if I get, you know, that I know where my help's coming from, I can depend on it. Um, and, um, you know, um, and I'm going to do my part on the ball. So to get back to your question about on the ball, looping technique, close out, arm half length, high hand, you know, using my off hand and my feet to kind of uh, come in and out, maybe get a little bit closer back, just kind of being active, activating the ball. Um, and then, um, you know, close it, you know, once they get into a shot, really getting a great contest. And I think we, um, really do a good job with, um, you know, really contesting every shot. Well, I think we can tell that uh, obviously you've given this tremendous thought and, uh, you know, not just thought in terms of complicating it, but thought in terms of simplifying it. Yep. So can you talk about that a little bit too? Because again, I think about one of the strengths that I understand from, from kind of looking into your defense, like it's, it's, this isn't difficult. It might be a new term or a new technique, but you're really focusing on basics. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it, I haven't reinvented the wheel in anything. Um, None of us just, have. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And, and I just, um, you know, I think as a head coach um, and when you become a head coach, 
the most important thing is to really um, understand, try to understand who you are and how you see the game. And there's a bunch of different ways to do everything, or, you know, or anything. And, um, you know, this is just kind of a, uh, a compilation of just um, how I've kind of always, how I was raised playing the game, how I, you know, believe is a way to be successful in it. And it, like you said, um, a lot of thought and a lot of language and a lot of things to simplify it. And um, I really believe on both, you know, and offensively we're, we're um, you know, pretty simplistic too. Um, but because I want players um, to have trust and to be able to play and not be overthinking things. And so, um, um, and, and so that, that's really um, a big key. And, and defensively, like you said, it's not, it's not um, overly complex, um, but the one thing um, is you're going to, you know, we're going to be disciplined. And I, and I think that's the thing. We're going to be disciplined. We're going to come down and, and I'm a defensive money coach. So you're, the guys understand, you know, um, that they're going to have to buy into this defense and playing it the way I want to play it in order to play. And, and fortunately we've had success and, and guys have kind of um, that come into the program now understand that and, and, and buy in pretty quickly, but we're going to be really disciplined um, every time down the court. We're not going to, you know, give away a possession, hopefully, or as few as we can, and we're going to make you earn it, and we're going to make you uh, score over the top of us with contested shots. But yeah, but um, I don't think it's it's overly complex, and we'll drill it, drill it, drill it. Um, and not it's not overly complex, but it's not necessarily easy, you know. And that that's the thing. And um, you know, it takes you know these players work their tail off and do some really really hard things. But um, but you know the the you know, but, but we've been fortunate to, to have won uh, championships and, and done some things and the guys, you know, understand how important it is. And, um, and, and, and really, you know, for me, when I think about offense, you know, everybody wants to play fast now with pace. And what does that mean? You know, like, and no one can really do it that well, except for a few teams. And, uh, but for me, pace is created by, defensive stops if you're getting turnovers or rebounds it, it just your offense flow you just you know you're just you're, you're playing in in a secondary break um you're playing with pace and if you have, you know if you're if you've got um some simple actions um to kind of get uh to, to in your secondary action you can kind of just flow uh right from defense from to offense if you're taking the ball out of the net too much um, it really slows you down and, um, you know, and, and, you know, that's not really here nor there, but, but I just, um, to me, it all kind of, you know, it starts defensively and it flows to offense and, um, you know, stops and, and turnovers equal, in my opinion, good, good offense with nice pace to it. Well, I love that connection there. And I guess the obvious question from my from 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 my mouth is so with so much focus on defense how does this help your offense because there's got to be some translation because obviously you value both sides of the ball but what are the things that most benefit your offense by playing against such a good defense every day yeah well i think that's one thing i mean i think uh um um you know it it really you know so it's interesting. So our offense usually um, may not look great early in the year um, because we don't necessarily um, probably put as much time, you know, we don't put as much time as we do into the defense and the defense comes along pretty well and pretty quickly, usually, you know, but, um, um, but yeah, they're going against, um, you know, a good defense every day. And, and, um, but I think, um, you know, our offense uh, and then, and then as the year goes on, when we get to, you know, the grind of the middle of the year um, and the, the defense is kind of uh, hopefully taken root by then um, we can then kind of transition and flip practice where we now are working more on offense 
and a little bit less on defense. And then the offense really kind of uh, starts to take root and starts to blossom. And then, um, you know, we, you know, I think we've done a pretty good job of playing our best basketball later in the year. Um, usually because our offense um, really starts to uh, come along later in the year. And I think it's, I think it helps the guys get through kind of the grind of, of the third and fourth and, and into the fifth months of the season. Um, and, um, you know, I think it uh, allows us, you know, if you look at the some of the analytics, um, you know, which I, which I'm a big fan of and, and um, you know, there's not a lot of teams that are really super efficient uh, on both sides of the ball. And I think uh, we've been uh, fortunate to be one of those um, that have been pretty efficient on both sides of the ball. And, you know, maybe that's why um, there's a whole host of reasons we have good players mainly, but, um, but yeah, I think going against a good defense and then offensively um, we have the same kind of mantra on that end of the ball. We, uh, side of the court rather where we're using spacing and pace um, and talent um, to really just space the court, uh, try to get the ball to the paint and um, and make great decisions, you know, so offense is a lot about decision making um, and um, being unselfish and um, what how guys are sliding and moving when the ball touches the paint. And so um, but but it, it's a lot of, again, hopefully um, if we're doing it right, guys are really uh, understanding what what we're trying to accomplish on both sides of the ball. Um, and really free to kind of play and not um, – we, we try not, you know, on the offensive side, we'll get too set heavy. Um, you know, we, we try to um, have actions and, um, you know, have a couple may, – maybe two actions. Maybe we'll run uh, per offensive set, but then use spacing and, and you know, hopefully getting teams into scramble and close out attacks and things like that to create advantages and then um, the talent of the players – uh, the decision making of the players um, hopefully is good enough, but um, but I think um, you know defense um, is is uh, is a harder uh, in some ways a harder thing to really get guys to buy into and really um, um, you know execute um, and really just have a um, a will about them. Um, that, um, you know, just we're not going to get scored on. And if we do, we're going to be dictating how we're scored on. And it's not going to, you know, we're going to make you beat us, so to speak. And that's that's the one thing I hope with our teams um, we've been is is uh, we're not going to beat ourselves and uh, we're going to make you beat us. And, um, you know, hopefully that's been the case. Oh, it's definitely been the case. And uh, again, like all these, all these insights that go into that uh, and the language of the vocabulary are just tremendous. So um, the, the one thing you mentioned, obviously, is about decision making. And I can't let you go with asking a little bit about that. Uh, the, you know, the absolutes on defense versus the things that are decision making based. Can you talk about that a little bit? Some of the things that are more you know, decision-making, like players got to make good decisions based on all the fundamentals and the, the tactics that you've taught them. Yeah. I mean, on the, on the defensive end, there's a little less than the offensive end, but one big one defensively is just um, we want to stay out of scramble. Uh, and, and so it, to stay out of scramble, it really is dictated by the whole. So really the decision-making and the feel of the guy that's in the hole of when to, when he really needs to help. Um, you know, and that's, again, something that's evolved. We used to just be uh, before the, you know, early, I guess in my first couple of years before a lot, a lot of three pointers were just, um, you know, it, 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 you know, the whole, just go, if you're not sure, just go and help. Um, and now it's don't help unless you're really sure you need to help help because if you if you don't you know if the guy can level them off or or uh you know if he's if the ball's not in a great spot um just running to the ball and for you know and, and the guy gets it out of there we're in scramble um so really uh decision making uh in the hole is is a um you know is is a big one that you know we've really um we really try to work with the guys on um, and so there, but, but offensively is where it's more prevalent to me. And it's just, um, you know, uh, we really give our guys a lot of freedom offensively, 
um, and want to give them confidence. And, and we have, we've been blessed. Um, you know, we've kind of evolved where we usually have four guys on the court that can all score the ball, shoot the ball, uh, be playmakers. Um, and, you know, just, just when to shoot and when to pass, when you have the ultimate confidence and, and, and kind of the freedom, you know, and so really understanding um, where the help is coming from, really understanding um, when you should be shooting and when you should be passing, you know, and, and, you, and you want guys to be confident and have a lot of belief in themselves. And, and, you know, so what you fight, I think, is just guys trying to make score the ball um, when they when they're really trying when they're you know trying to score through their man or through help, you know, and and um, and and really, you know, you don't want them to lose the aggression. You don't want them to lose the confidence. You just want them to see it um, and have the discipline and toughness um, to make you know to pass it if that's what the situation calls for. And um, and you know, and part of that's the guys off the ball too of really sliding. You know, we really work a lot offensively on when the ball touches the paint. Um, you know, this is something we stole from uh, Jay Wright, you know, and, and you know, he's played a smaller, you know, he's one of the, you know, and I don't know if he's one first, but they've been a guard-oriented kind of system uh, for years, all the way back to Kyle Lowry and Foy and all those guys. And, um, you know, and, and just this, you know, almost like a shell, offensive shell where you're really working on, moving the ball around the perimeter, having a guy drive the ball into the paint, and then really um, the other three guys really sliding. Um, you know, again, it, it's like defense and like you got to slide in unison. You got to – you can't slide into each other um, and and really uh, getting good movement along the perimeter. We work with our bigs who, uh, if we're not in five out, um, are in the dunk spot, we call it the short corner. Um, and really getting them to understand how to slide along the baseline on a on a uh, on a on a paint touch, um, a dribble paint touch, and so um, you know that that's the biggest decision making. Um, it's just uh, we want you to attack the paint um, and uh, force the team into scramble, and then what is your decision? Um, do you see the decision, and then young players don't see it. Uh, a lot of film work, a lot of great coaching by assistant coaches, um, positional coaches, and um, a lot of film work and 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 just um, mo- mainly experience. You know, m- you know, making bad decisions and and then making good decisions and and really starting to understand and learn that process. And that's a big part offensively of uh, of kind of the maturation of of, of players in in our program. I've always wanted to to ask, and I've asked certain coaches off air, but uh, a great defensive team, great defensive coach like yourself. I'm curious, do you do anything to connect for your offense within the season? The fact that they're playing against such a good defense every day in practice, that when they do score in practice or they have success in practice, that that actually translates more than the reality because you're not going to play against your defense all the time? If that you know that. Yeah, yeah, that's a no. I don't, unfortunately. And and I'm just curious because, question. Yeah, yeah. Like, and again, when I talk about as a head coach, understanding who you are. Like, I, me personally, I see the game um, from a defensive standpoint, and then move into offense. Even though, you know, as a crappy player, I loved all. I shot every time I had the ball. Like that's all. I you know, I didn't play any defense, and I just want to score. But as a coach, I see things much more through um a defense and so when a point is scored um uh i i really view it as bad defense and rarely view it as good offense occasionally <laughs> i, I could just picture that too now coach <laughs> yeah it, so so actually what i've had to do you know so i've given um more and more of the offensive uh, i've given the offense at this point my associate head coach kyle saplick who's been with me all nine years i coached as a player i've who's a brilliant basketball mind and I have the utmost confidence in I've given the reins of the offense to him because what was happening was I just, I'd never talked about offense in practice, even when we were supposed to be working on practice. And so, um, you know, my assistants have been with me a long time and we know each other well. And, you know, they remind me that, Hey, you know, John, this, this part of practice is offense, you know, so you need to help (laughs) reinforce and give, 
you know, feedback on the offense. And it's hard for me to do, you know, and, and um, uh, I've gotten better with it. And I've given, uh, like I said, uh, the reins to, to Kyle for the most part. And, and um, you know, and, and, and so um, again, that's just, uh, you know, understanding, uh, you know, we all have blind spots or what our strengths and weaknesses are, or how we see the game or whatever. And, and, uh, hiring a staff that complements you really well or or people you know and 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 um and so um but yeah that that had been a problem for years and, and it caused a, you know a few arguments up in the office about um and certainly in practice i just um i i, I can't see anything other than the defense a lot of times and um you know um and so um it, it, it it's something that uh i've gotten better with um, and, and, uh, but, but, um, you know, it's weird. I was an offensive player and, and now, um, as a coach, it's just, uh, I have a very defensive centric, uh, view of the game. And, um, I guess, um, it's worked out. Uh, just a bit, just a bit. And probably will continue to, and, uh, you know, coach, I mean, this has been amazing. I know coaches will have to listen to this multiple times to be able to again, visualize and picture it, but, uh, you know, having watched some of your clips and watched some of the stuff you guys do, I mean, I encourage everyone to study your defense, just tremendous stuff. So thank you so much for spending time with us. Yeah. Thanks Chris for having me and, and continue the great work. Um, a big fan of your, um, of your social media sites and, and, and the work you're doing with other coaches and, and with just um, teaching the game and, and um, you know, really, uh, really nice to be on your show and, and nice to meet you. Well, thank you coach and take care. Thanks for listening. Be sure to rate review and subscribe to the show and to give the basketball podcast and this week's guest a shout out on social media to show your support for us sharing the game and to stay up to date on all things basketball immersion Subscribe to our newsletter at basketballmergent.com slash newsletter.